So we've been in our series, Taming Lions, for the past three weeks, and we're talking about the monsters within us. Because all of us have these monsters inside, monsters like fear and anger, uh, sometimes apathy, impurity, anxiety. We, we could go on with the different monsters that live inside of us. And, and these monsters threaten to devour us from the inside out if we don't learn how to master them. And so we're taking a couple weeks here uh, to look at the life of Daniel and to see some of the stories from Daniel's life because Daniel was a person who mastered the monsters within. From a very young age, he was committed to living the kind of life that allowed him to have victory because he had mastery over those inner beasts. Uh, we started, remember, two weeks ago in Daniel chapter 6, verse 4. Remember, the, the other government officials were trying to dig up dirt on Daniel. Uh, they wanted to get him in trouble, and they were unable to find anything. This is what Daniel 6.4 says. It says, Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. And remember, at this point in Daniel's life, he's maybe somewhere between 60, or 75 and 80. He's been working in government for about 65 years. And in 65 years, They couldn't find anything that he had done wrong. And here's why. Because he was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. The reason that Daniel was able to master those inner monsters was because he was committed to a lifestyle of being faithful, responsible, and trustworthy. So last week, remember, we or two weeks ago, we talked about what it means to be faithful. To be faithful means to choose to keep saying yes to purity and no to impurity. And then last week we talked about what it means to be responsible. To be responsible means to do right with what I can and to trust God with what I cannot do. And Daniel was committed over the course of his life to be faithful, to be responsible, and to be trustworthy. So let's start this morning by by giving a definition of what it means to be trustworthy. A trustworthy person speaks truth and lives truth regardless of the consequences. So a trustworthy person is a person whose words and actions are aligned with everything that is good. Actually, a better way to say that would be that their words and actions are aligned with who God is. So the way I speak, the way I talk, it's aligned with who God is. It matches God's character. The way I act, the way I treat other people as I go through my life, all of that matches perfectly with God's character. That's what it means to be trustworthy. That that I speak truth and I live truth, I'm aligned with God regardless of the consequences. Because sometimes it's not always easy to speak truth and live truth. Sometimes it's not always easy to use my words and my actions to be aligned with God. Sometimes there's pressure, there's fear, there's potential for harm or loss if I do the right thing. But a trustworthy person is willing to speak truth and live truth regardless of the consequences. And that's Daniel. So if you have your Bibles, move to Daniel chapter 5. Today we're going to look at a story where Daniel demonstrates this kind of trustworthiness I'm going to start reading in verse 1. Daniel chapter 5, verse 1. It says, King Belshazzar, let's stop right there. Don't worry, we'll do more than two words at a time, I promise. But last time we saw Daniel, a different person was king, right? It was King Nebuchadnezzar. And so I want to just help you understand what's going on here because this is a clue to us about how much time has passed since the last time we saw Daniel. King Nebuchadnezzar reigned for about 43 years. And then after his reign, there was this period of six years where there was a lot of drama. As often happens in world empires, different people are killing each other, trying to be the king. And ultimately, uh, this guy comes to power whose name is Nabinius. And he is married to Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, which is probably where he gets the claim to the throne. And he's actually a, a reasonable king for Babylon, but he's never in Babylon. He's a kind of a warrior king, and so he's always outside of Babylon fighting battles, uh, mostly against the Persians and the Medes, 
And so whenever he is away, he appoints his son to be king, and his son's name is Belshazzar. And so what we see here is that King Belshazzar is ruling, which means we know this is during the reign of Nabinius, and King Belshazzar is kind of like a tenant king. He's ruling in his place, but for those who are in Babylon, he's viewed as the king. And here's what we also know. The year is 539. And we know that because at the end of the story, Darius the Mede, who is a general for the Persians, is going to overthrow Babylon. That happened in 539. And so Belshazzar is king, but Darius is at the gate. Now, if you were the king of an empire, and you were left in charge, and your arch enemy was literally at the gate trying to starve you out, what would you be doing? Ready the defenses, right? Muster the troops. uh, Fortify the gates. Get the weapons ready. What does King Belshazzar do? King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. And instead of getting the city ready for battle, he says, let's have a party. So this is a clue right here as to what kind of a king he is, right? He's probably not the wisest of kings. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, and, and tasted may not be the right word, uh, he tasted a lot of the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem, that's a long sentence. Basically, Nebuchadnezzar, when he overthrew Jerusalem, sacked the city, robbed the temple, took all of the gold out of the temple of Israel, uh, the stuff that they used in worship to Yahweh, the God, and brought it back to Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar just had it in storage because he recognized this is kind of holy stuff, we shouldn't use it. But but here again, we see Belshazzar not necessarily as wise as Nebuchadnezzar. So he took all the treasures out of the temple that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Here's what we know about Belshazzar. He is a godless king, and he's ruling over a godless culture. Uh, look, at, look at what we can learn about him just in a, a few paragraphs. This is a, a man who has no morals, uh, no sense of right and wrong, no desire for holiness, no wisdom whatsoever. And you see at the very end, it says that they praise the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. So these are false gods. They've got idols built out of all these different materials, and they're, they're worshiping all of these false gods, but not the true God. As I read about this godless king who's ruling over a godless culture, it, it raises a question in my mind. And the question is, how, how do we, as followers of Christ, as Christians, as those who believe in the one true God, how do we engage a culture like this? What does it look like for us to live in a culture that is increasingly hostile towards God and religion? And that's where we are. You know, a survey this year uh, that sought to categorize people in America by religious belief discovered that the largest category of people in this survey is now the people who say they have no religious belief. They're often called the nuns. And the nuns are now a larger category of Americans than evangelicals or than Catholics. We live in a world that is slowly, maybe not slowly, drifting away from the idea of God. And so how do we as as followers of God, as believers in Jesus, how do we live in this culture? How do we live in a culture that has rejected any sense of morality? How do we live in a culture that doesn't have the same values as us? How do we live in a culture that, like Belshazzar, worshiped false gods? Now, we may not worship gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. We have gods like materialism and popularity and political expediency. We worship at those temples. So what does it look like for us? Let me suggest to you that that Christians in culture choose to either assimilate, isolate, or infiltrate. 
Those are the three choices. Well, when you live in a culture that does not have the same values as you, you choose either to assimilate, isolate, or infiltrate. To assimilate essentially means that you choose to speak and live exactly like everyone around you. There's no difference. No one could look at you and say, that person has a different set of beliefs than me. That person has a different worldview than me. They look exactly like everyone around them. That's a person who chooses to assimilate into culture. And here's the thing. If you're a Christian and you know the truth about God, you know of God's love and his grace and his mercy, and you choose to simply assimilate into culture, you're doing no one any good. Because you're not experiencing the life you were created to live, and you're not helping anyone around you by pointing them to the truth about God. Some Christians choose rather than assimilate to to isolate, right? They choose to speak and live completely separate from culture. They, they kind of just get out of the world. We're not going to have anything to do with the people around us. Uh, in fact, they probably spend a lot of their time judging the people around them. They've isolated themselves from culture. Now, here, here's the thing. These people, maybe, maybe they're getting a small taste of the life they were created to live because they've got some kind of a sense of God's holiness, but they've missed a whole big chunk of who God is because they've completely missed that God is loving and merciful and gracious and kind and inclusive and loves the whole world. They've completely missed that. And so they're not living the life that God created them to live either. And they're not helping anyone around them by pointing them to the truth of God. See, what we're really called to do as Christ followers is not to assimilate the culture and not to isolate from the culture, but actually to infiltrate the culture. That means we live uniquely in the world. We live a life that looks different from the people around us for the purpose of pointing them to God. We live and speak differently because we want people to know who God is. You see, when you choose to infiltrate culture, which is to say, when you choose to live and speak differently for the purpose of pointing people to God, now now you are living the life you were created to live. Because every single one of us was created to represent God in his creation. And so when we infiltrate culture, that's what we're doing. And not only are we living the life we were created to live, but now we are pointing others to the truth about God. And so we're helping them experience the life they were created to live. So the challenge for us as Christ followers is to choose rather than assimilate into the culture and rather than isolate from the culture to infiltrate the culture. Daniel Daniel had these choices too. Remember when he was carried from Jerusalem to Babylon as a teenager, the very first thing that Nebuchadnezzar tried to do was to get all of these young Jewish men to assimilate the Babylonian culture. He gave them new names, He gave them Babylonian food. He made them live in Babylonian houses. He gave them a Babylonian education because he wanted them to look just like the Babylonians. But Daniel chose faithfulness. He said, I'm not going to assimilate this culture. I'm going to be faithful. And then remember last week we we talked about the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and he wanted all the wise men to interpret it and first to tell them what the dream was and none of them could do it and so... Nebuchadnezzar said, ah, just kill them all. You know, in that moment, Daniel could have isolated himself. He could have stepped out and said, hey, I'm not with the wise men. I'm not part of that group. We're over here on our own doing the Yahweh thing. We're not like them. He could have isolated himself, said we have nothing to do with them, but he didn't, did he? Instead, he chose to be responsible. He said, I'm going to do right with what I can do, and I'm going to trust God with what I can't do, And so rather than assimilate the culture and rather than isolate the culture, Daniel chose to infiltrate the culture. And here's the thing. When you are someone who chooses to speak and live differently in the world, what happens is that when people find themselves in crisis, they come your way. And Belshazzar is about to find himself in crisis. So he's got this party going on. And they're drinking the wine out of the goblets from Jerusalem. And they're having a good time. And all of a sudden, this inexplicable event happens. 
a massive giant hand appears and starts writing on the wall. Now, you've got to think, Belshazzar's first thought is, I've had too much wine, (laughs) right? (laughs) What was in that wine, right? But eventually, they realize, hey, everybody's seen the same thing that I'm seeing, and that writing on the wall is still there, so this is actually really happening, and he goes into full-on meltdown. He calls the wise men, hey, what's going on? Tell me what this means. And nobody knows what it means. And everybody is going into a panic. This is a crisis. So what do they do? They call the trustworthy person, right? Look at Daniel chapter 5, verse 10. It says the queen, I'm going to stop after two words again. So (laughs) this is probably not Belshazzar's wife because she wouldn't have really been the queen, right? Right? This is probably actually his mother. Because remember, the real king is out in battle. So this is his mother, who remember is Nebuchadnezzar's daughter. So she remembers Nebuchadnezzar. She remembers what Daniel did for him, what Daniel did with him. She remembers how Nebuchadnezzar loved and embraced Daniel. So the queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. So that gives us a hint as to Belshazzar's state of mind, right? He's, the, the color has drained out of his face. He, he's in a crisis. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. This is Daniel's reputation. There's something about him that's different. He lives differently. He's, he's not like the rest of us. He has a spirit from God. Now, we know that that's the Holy Spirit. They didn't know that. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understand... By the way, if you're looking for words that you want to be described by, here they are, right? Excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, a spirit of the gods... This is how we want to be described. And people will see us this way, not because we look just like them, not because we separate ourselves from them, but because we choose to live differently with them. Understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. That name didn't stick because Daniel didn't assimilate. Now, let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Who do people call when crisis hits? Who do people call when they have a problem, when they have a need that's really causing problems for them? They call the person who's trustworthy. And so they call Daniel. So Daniel comes to the king, sees the the words on the wall. Here's the king's story. And and now Daniel has an opportunity. What's, What's he going to do? Is he going to try to make the king feel better? Or is he going to actually tell the king the truth? And, of course, Daniel chooses the second because a trustworthy person does what? They speak truth. And so Daniel begins by reminding King Belshazzar about King Nebuchadnezzar. He says, King, listen, your father, Nebuchadnezzar, who's actually more like a grandfather, but your father, Nebuchadnezzar, he had this problem too. He didn't worship God. He didn't follow God, and God had to deal with him. He dealt with him with dreams. He did these really crazy things, turned him into a wild beast for a while. And and then eventually, he said, Nebuchadnezzar came to believe that that God, Yahweh God, the God of the Hebrews, was the real God. He says, but you, King Belshazzar, you've not realized that. And then Daniel goes into this kind of speech about all of the things that Belshazzar has done wrong. And this is how he finishes it. In verse 23, he says, And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know. I love this. Well, all these things that you're worshiping, king, they're rocks. They're pieces of wood. They're they're like gold or silver. They don't see anything. They don't hear anything. They don't know anything. And this is what he says then. But the God in whose hand is your breath, and whose all your ways you have not 
honored. The one true living God, the God who holds your breath in his hand, you've ignored him. And you've not honored him. Daniel's telling the truth to Belshazzar, and it's not an easy truth, it's a difficult truth, but it's an important truth for Belshazzar to hear because if he doesn't hear that, he can't understand the words on the wall. So let's get to the words on the wall. We'll put them up here. The words say, Mene, mene, tekel, parsin. Which interpreted is, you have been weighed. You have been measured. That's what many, many means. You've been weighed, you've been measured, you've been evaluated. Tekel means you have been found lacking. Some of you have seen this in a movie, right? That Was it Knight's Tale? Is that what it is? He says, you've been weighed, you've been measured, you've been found lacking. They stole that from the Bible. And then he says, your kingdom will be divided. Daniel says to Belshazzar, Belshazzar, you've not measured up. God's evaluated you. He's watched you. You know, you had the truth about Nebuchadnezzar. You knew who God was. It was there for you, and you chose to ignore it. You've been weighed, you've been measured, and you have been found lacking, and so God is going to take your kingdom from you. And here's how the story ends. He loses the kingdom that very night. That very night, Darius the Mede breaks into Babylon, overthrows and ends the Babylonian Empire, and so begins the Persian Empire. And Belshazzar and all of his thousands that are partying, the party ends very, very badly for them. Daniel says, King, you've not measured up, and God's done with you. Do you think those were easy words for Daniel to say? I mean, just just think about this. This is the most powerful man in the world. If he says, I want you dead, you're dead. You don't get to argue. You don't get to complain. That's it. There's no justice system. There's no appeals. If the king says you're dead, you're dead. And generally speaking, if you tell the king something he doesn't want to hear, he says you're dead, especially a king like this, who's already demonstrated he has no wisdom, no common sense, and he's drunk. So for Daniel to go before the king and say, yep, your kingdom's done. Do you think there was a little bit of fear going on for Daniel? Do you think that maybe the monster within that he's dealing with here is the monster of fear? Because sometimes, maybe most of the time, it's fear that keeps us from being trustworthy. You see, it's easy to speak truth and live truth when nobody cares. It's a lot more difficult to speak truth and live truth when it's not popular or when you're going to offend someone, or when you're going to tell someone something that they don't want to hear. But a trustworthy person conquers that inner monster, that monster of fear, and they do what they know they've been called to do. So so what is it about Daniel that enables him to do that? You see, I think that Daniel was confident in God's presence, and so he was committed to God's path. Daniel knew that God was with him. He was confident that God was right there and that God had a plan and that God wouldn't let anything happen to Daniel that wasn't for his best. And by the way, sometimes, sometimes God lets his people die. And Paul said what? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Today, in other parts of the world, our brothers and sisters in Christ are meeting in places where they know it could cost them their lives. And it will. Some of them will die maybe today because of their faith. And for them, that's better. God has said, come home. I'm I'm ready for you to be with me. And so Daniel is confident here that God is present, that God is active, that God is concerned, and that God has his best interests at heart. And so because of his confidence in God, Daniel is committed to the path that God has given him to walk. And that means in this moment, at this time, Regardless of how much fear he may have, he is going to speak truth and he is going to live truth. And I think this is the big challenge for us today. Is are we willing to be confident in God's presence so that we can be committed to the path he has called us to walk? And the path that he has called us to walk is not to assimilate into culture. It's not to isolate ourselves from culture, but it is to infiltrate culture. You see, God has placed you exactly where he wants you. 
And he has surrounded you with exactly the people that he wants around you. God put Daniel in Babylon and put kings around him so he could influence the movements of the world. And and maybe God has put you in your neighborhood so you can influence your neighbors. Or God has put you at your workplace so you can influence your coworkers. Or God has put you in your school so you can influence your classmates. Wherever it is that God has put you, he has put you there to infiltrate culture, to live differently in the world so that you can point people to the truth about God. And here's the truth about God. Daniel gives us part of it, right? He says, hey, look, Belshazzar, God has done with you. You've not measured up. You are evil. You are wicked. And God cannot stand evil. God cannot stand wickedness. Do you know why that's true? Why God can't stand evil? Why God can't stand wickedness? It's because it destroys his creation. It's because it destroys us. We are his most valued creation And when evil is part of our world, we are destroyed by it, and so God cannot stand evil. But that's only the first half of the story, right? The second half of the story is that God is incredibly patient and incredibly loving and incredibly gracious, and he is waiting, not willing that any should perish. And this is is the beautiful part about who God is and what he's doing for us. You see, sometimes I hear people say, If evil is so wrong, and if God is so powerful, why doesn't he do something about it? Have you ever heard that question? Why doesn't God do something about evil? Sometimes I want to ask the question, well, do you think think it would be better if God just eliminated all evil? Yeah, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Why doesn't God do that? Why doesn't God just eliminate all evil? Yes, Why why doesn't God eliminate evil the moment it happens? So right as evil is going to happen, God eliminates it. And we say, that sounds really good, doesn't it? Why doesn't God do that? If he's all-powerful, if he's all-loving, why doesn't he eliminate evil in the moment it happens? So remember that time yesterday when you yelled at your kids? Remember that, that time when you told a little white lie at work? Or you cheated on that test? At school? It was just a little thing, but it was evil. So maybe it's not so bad that God is patient, waiting to destroy evil. Because you see, God doesn't destroy us the moment we do something wrong. God doesn't end us the moment we mess up. Because he's patient. Because he's gracious. Because he's full of mercy. And he wants us to repent and come back to him. That's why he sent Jesus, right? Because here's here's Jesus, the only person who ever lived who didn't do evil the only person who ever lived who didn't deserve to be destroyed by God, and yet he allowed himself to be destroyed by God so that he could take on himself all of God's deserved wrath. So God could direct it to Jesus instead of to David. And so that if David gives his life to Jesus, Jesus gives me his life in return. And so God no longer sees me as the guy that sins and messes up. God no longer sees me as the guy that does evil, the guy that does wickedness, the guy who yells at his kids sometimes, the guy who tells a little white lie sometimes, the guy that has a violent thought sometimes. God doesn't see me that way at all. He sees me through the blood of Jesus, which means he sees me as righteous and holy and sinless. That's why God doesn't destroy evil right away. That's why God is patient. And that's the God we want to point people to. But guess what? We can't point people to that God if we assimilate ourselves completely into culture. Because if we look just like everybody else, we have no message. And we can't point people to that God if we isolate ourselves from culture. Because if we're over here and they're over here and we're just judging them because they're not like us, we have no message for them. God has put you exactly where you are. And he has surrounded you with the people he's put around you so that you can influence them with his message of love and grace and mercy and truth. And you can only do that if you live differently. This is what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount in in Matthew chapter 5. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Okay, so, so when you live differently, you cannot be hidden. 
The reason everybody knew to call Daniel was because he lived differently. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. You see, God has lit a lamp in you. When you give your life to Jesus, Jesus shines his light into your life. And God says, we don't, he didn't give you that light so you could hide it. But on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Now listen, this is our verse for the week. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. You see, it's it's a way of saying, so you may brighten their world. Right? Live in a way that brightens their world. So that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Live your life in the world different from the world. So you will brighten their world and they will change their mind about God. So how will your light shine this week? Whose world will you brighten this week? Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for making us your children. And we could go on and on and on with all of uh, the amazing gifts that you have poured into our lives. Thank you for brightening our world. Help us to be people who are shining your light into your world so that people will be changed and will give their lives to you. Help us, Father, to be a church that is not just like everybody else. Help us to be a church that is not separate, but we are a church that is shining your light into Centerville and into Springboro and Miamisburg and Kettering, into Beaver Creek, into Dayton, into Franklin, into Middletown, and as far as we can shine your light, Father, help us to shine your light into your world. In your name, amen.